the last of the cowboys to giddy up gone, boys. Eighteen wheels on the concrete, it's a slow and dying breed. Rolling like Jesse James, a modern day outlaw game. If you're out here riding with me, come on back and make some noise. We're the last of the cowboys. Well, we're sailing right along with a guy that's not uh, unfamiliar to the camera. Sailing along with Mr. Uh, Chris Kegelhan there. Uh, how are we doing this afternoon, sir? Good, my man. How are you? We're doing good. Hey, well, this uh, this truck that you're rolling in, it's been spotted on the internet a couple times. It's actually been on big rig videos a couple times as well. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, give me the rundown on it? Uh, it's a 56 925, sitting on a 1980 A model chassis, pretty much up front. Uh, it's got a V rear clip, a uh, double eagle sleeper on it, but it's uh, got a high flow Cummins in it, a 13 speed. 10 4. You know, I've seen you around. Uh, in this truck quite a while. I mean, it seems like it might be a favorite of yours to drive. Yeah, I run it pretty much all the time. Just me and another guy will run it. It goes everywhere, California, Florida. It's in New York City a lot, pretty much. I'm not afraid to take it anywhere. It's been all the way out uh, Seattle, Washington area, all kinds of, basically whatever. I sneak in LA at night, come out at night, so I don't really have a, too much of an issue. Now, you said you sneak in and out and whatnot, and you're not afraid to take it many places. How'd you come across a truck? Uh, I've always had one. I had uh, I had one, uh, it's a 52. I bought it when I was a little bit younger there. It's a, it was a wrecker with a sleeper on and everything. I got all the parts for it and everything. And So I kind of came across this from a gentleman up by my house there in PA. There. His name's Frank, and he had this truck almost 20 years, built it. Went through a couple of different phases where they had like a 60 inch kind of wear flat top on it. And then, you know, they used to, this truck used to be a single axle. It actually came down from uh, Canada from a uh, guy up there, Mackie the Mover. It was one of their trucks, and Frank bought it off him for it. Sounds like the truck had quite the history. We run this anywhere, you know. I, I don't care anymore. I just. It's got no front brakes on, no seat belts. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have to have it, but, you know. It's the way I choose to a truck. There's no buzzers in it. It's got light. You just light for the air. I have a it has a wigwag that comes down, tells you to, you know, when it's out of air and stuff like that. You know, I just have like a Bluetooth kind of radio set up in it. You know, a fan, a rooftop air. It's, you know, your neck's stiff as hell in the in, in the summertime because all it does is blow on your neck. But I don't know. I just enjoy it. I don't know. I guess I'm weird. Yeah, no, that's there, there's nothing weird about that at all. It's close to 60 years old. Some people can't believe it's still on the road or whatever, or, you know, like I said, or you know, run it. Every time you get fuel with it, people are asking you about it. So Some people have no clue. Some people just come up like, oh, is that 1980? And you tell them like 56 and they like fall on the ground. But I enjoy people looking at it and asking about it. So that's why I put the, the truck number is 56 on it, hoping that people just look at it and tell, you know, they can tell what year it is. After a while, <clears throat> you'll be able to refer people to this video and they can uh, learn everything they need to know about it. Now, what are some other uh, odd or interesting moments you've had on the road uh, when you're driving there? You know, I've trucked entertainment for 20 years, so I've seen a lot of different things and been a lot of places. I've been, been in the White House. I've had, you know, FBI. I've had go through my truck. I've been escorted across town through D.C., you know, Basically, just tell me don't stop. You follow me, run all the red lights, and then just hang a hard right into the White House compound. Stop. They'll put it. They they pull a concrete barrier out when you're coming up to it. They pull it out, fly through it. They close it. You sit there a second while they, uh, you know, they run the forklift and the barricades behind you. Then they look at the truck again, go inside it again, and. You know, then I'd go out onto the White House lawn. I used to put a stage up there on the White House lawn for Easter egg uh, roll they do every year. And you know, you mentioned your father was a truck driver or still is a truck driver. You have to clarify that. But you know, how did you find yourself in the in the seat of a truck? My old man put me there. 
So my dad drove for somebody for probably on and off for 35 years, and the last guy that he drove for was, uh, I think he drove for 25 years, and he stopped running over the road when I was, when I graduated high school. You know, I used to go with him every summer, Christmas breaks, Easter breaks, and at daycare, we used to go to North Carolina, I used to leave like every Christmas, you know, evening, you know, everybody thinks Christmas, and then the, the world stops, but the day after Christmas, everybody wants to still, so. Uh, any chance that I could go with him, I did. And uh, I used to wake up five in the morning when I knew he'd be going somewhere. I, I'd run down the street and get the truck, start it, and I'd bring it back up the street and I'd park it on the corner and I'd go back to bed just to drive it, you know. So, and then uh, I drove at night doing dump truck stuff and I went to college. My parents told me you know, I did two years of college or whatever. I, that I could keep my, my parents' health insurance and stuff like that. So it was always something I did, always wanted to do anyway. But, you know, we kind of like knew it was going to happen, I guess, but they tried not to make it not happen. But so uh, I just always wanted a truck and then basically got come out of a concert and saw the trucks, you know, picking up the sound equipment and stuff like that. And so it was more interesting to me to like I guess to deliver Cheerios you know to deliver this and Cheerios or food warehouses and stuff like that but that's kind of I got started I got started with a friend uh, you know another friend of mine and we we worked for a company out of New Jersey doing it so and then uh, it just basically took off from there and my first truck I was uh, I think I was 22 years old and I couldn't get financing for it for nothing my parents put up their house for me and uh I walked in at dealerships, thirty thousand dollars. I couldn't get a truck. They would not finance me at all, nothing. And then uh, Cooper's where Kenworth up by my house, where I live now. They it was like a mob outfit, you know, like Frankie's financing or whatever. Like you, you know, I was gonna get my legs broken if I didn't pay. But I I took a loan out enough to if I could if I something happened where I didn't make it, you know, I could pay for my truck payment for a little bit with a uh, a job, you know. So that's what I kind of wound up doing, and I I had a I had a lease to FedEx Custom Critical for a year because I couldn't I wasn't all able to get my own authority because I couldn't get uh, insurance. So I went out and did uh, work for Custom Critical doing like critical shipments and stuff like that. I had like we do like all kinds of weird government stuff and drugs and. You know, all Viagra. I used to run out of Pfizer all the time. Like, you know, just always high dollar loads and stuff like that. And I did that for a year until I was able to get my own authority. And then uh, I started doing stuff on my own and and doing entertainment. So, and I was a guy that like everybody called last minute. Like they called me on Christmas to go. You know, something happened or a truck broke down, and I basically just went and did whatever, whenever. I didn't give it. You know, I just constantly, uh, you know, was there in the clutch, I guess. Well, that's pretty interesting. Do you think uh, working that year for FedEx Custom Critical kind of opened your eyes to a particular uh, segment of the market that you could uh, kind of really make some money with? Yeah, you have to be specialized. You have to, you have to do something that nobody else can do. Like any guy can open a door and sit in a dock and unload 30 pallets of food and stuff like that. But it takes a dude, you know, like, Leaving on weekends and birthday parties. I mean, I've missed funerals. I've missed births, all kinds of stuff. I mean, like you name it, I ain't been there. But people knew what I wanted to do, so they never. Uh, a lot of people didn't question it. I guess. I mean, they look. They look at you for a little bit. Like my my wife's friends used to look at me. And, you know, just oh, I always trucked. Oh, I was always away. I mean, I was gone. When I first started, I'd be gone from my house 340 days a year, 330 days a year when I do my taxes, like, gone, like, straight. You know, I'd be home for holidays and stuff like that once in a while, but I did that for four years straight, and I uh, started, like, coming home, and, like, houses were in different spots, and uh, my parents started looking older, and I tried to do, like, try to get into doing local business and stuff and in and out of the city, and... Like, nobody wants to go to New York City, and nobody wants to go to New York City with a truck. And then nobody wants to go to New York City and 
be on the street, you know. So I started doing a bunch of that. And like I said, I, no matter what day it was, it could be, you know, you could call me at midnight, I'd get up and leave. And, and I never discussed money. I never did anything. I just always went and did it. When somebody calls you at 2 in the morning and their trucks broke down or whatever, I just, my mentality was just to get it done and go do it and, uh, you know, discuss money later. Some people would call me up and say, hey, dude, when are you going to bill me for this? And I'd be like, oh, when I, you know, when I get to it or whatever. But it was never helping somebody out wasn't about money. Sometimes I'd go do stuff and not even worry, charge them or whatever. i just have a favor. Like, you know, I don't compete for prices. If you don't like what I do or what I give you, then have somebody else do it. But uh, the way I've always done my business is that I, you, I have the same price to them if they're loyal to me. Like if... On Christmas Day, if you call me, the price to go to Florida is the same price that on June June 20th. You know, it's never, I never look at the day that I'm doing something. So no matter what, every day of the year, no matter what day it is, it's the same price for me to go to Florida. It's the same price for me to go to California. It's, I don't restructure anything because there's no trucks or it's freight slow or this or that. And in turn, the people have always just used me and, and, and I just get things done. And I may be in the dock at like five o'clock on a Friday and we'll have three trucks loading and it happens all the time. I have everything set up, three trucks. This don't fit on three trucks. It's gotta go on four. Now it's five o'clock on a Friday and the stuff has to be there usually like, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, let's say. Uh, they don't want to hear that I got to try to find a truck or whatever. I throw another trailer in there. I fly people in, uh, you know, we'll take a, a trailer halfway across, drop it, somebody else will grab it. Like, I have been, I have done some of the most, you know, weird to get what I need to get done. And, you know, I don't tell them about it. They don't know about it. You know, what I go through every day. You know, I just get the job done. My old man, he retired and uh, basically worked for me full time. He went back to being a mechanic, so he was always, he was a mechanic and you know a driver, and that's how he got started driving. He was just filling at night and stuff, which is a lot what a lot of guys did back then. They were just were mechanics, and then they started driving. I liked it, so uh, so he would drive for me at night. He'd sleep in his, you know sleep in his car in the truck, or he'd go back to where they work. And when I got so it was like just busy and busy and busy. It was like you know. I, run the city so he'd run a load at night come back home you know get two three hours of sleep and he did that for me for like four years three or four years like when I started getting big and he, re he basically retired and then and it works for me full time you know so like most uh, followers would just be like yeah I'm done you know but he's still going now they're going up to Boston tonight it's like 10 degrees up there, snow out the end, but we got a, a pretty big show up there they're doing tonight for Nike and stuff, so they're gonna load, they'll load that back out and then uh, they're gonna come back over to Pennsylvania. I got, I think, three trailers that are going out to Detroit for Lamborghini or something, and uh, they'll do that for Wednesday and stuff like that, and then by the time I get done with this, the land and going up here, I'm gonna uh, go up to, uh, back up north there and head out to Seattle. 10-4. Well, that's cool that you have such a diverse client base. You know, a lot of people that are familiar with you, they know that they may know uh, that you do something with uh, with trucks and, and racing trucks on on an oval or uh, in, a, in a race format. So, why don't you fill people in that that don't know anything about what you do with your with your race trucks? Uh, let's uh, talk about that for a bit. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got involved doing. Uh doing like road racing with the uh, uh, up and coming race series there. And uh, so basically they needed someone that could move the truck back and forth and get it to places, basically just get it to the tracks. And and then they gave me a pretty big chunk of change to run the truck for a year. So basically they leased me the truck. I raced it for them under their sponsorship. I got it to where it needed to be every race. I had to make it to, I think, 10 out of 12 races or something. And, uh, you know, big truck racing was, like, big back in the day. And, you know, in the mid-80s when Smokey and the Bandit came out, it was, like, kind of just, you know, they ran, like, big tracks. And it was, like, you know, 100-lap, you, know, you know, deals. And what had happened is it was the trucks got too fast and, 
they, they were start, started getting scared they were going to kill somebody going in the crowd and you know because when you have a car going in the crowd it's a different deal but when you get a truck going into the crowd it's you know it's a lot worse <laughs> did the first race uh just had a blast man i mean just like road racing in a truck and you know it's just just awesome time my family came it's like maybe i think there was eight or nine of us that did it and we just had a good time and it's just the series i'm in now is it's called the bandit series and it's it's opened up and it's like huge i went up buying another truck from a guy in uh that was in our series his name's robbie he, he builds trucks and he just he needed the money to start a shop and stuff like that so i bought the truck and brought it home and i thought you know we were racing in the south and everything so my colors on my trucks are a lot of them are orange so i wound up uh painting it like the general lee and uh put the whole one on the side of it i have the rebel flag on the roof of it but it's you know with trucker girls and that's where the stars are and uh you know, down there it's not a big deal, but you know, all this crap that's starting to happen and stuff, and I didn't want to get the kicked out of me if I had it up north, so I just I put the trucker girls in it. It kind of it's a cool design, and the people down there just love it. I got the Dixie horns in it, and just kids, and I mean, it's you know, it causes a lot of attention, and it, it, all the kids and families enjoy it. So, um, and we just been like rolling all over the country, just going plate track after track and just crowds are just nuts and we're, we're up to like 15 or 16 trucks now and this is like we did a we did a little bit uh one year we did a, a full year this year and just everywhere we go sold out i mean you know from having 110 people there maybe total to 10,000 13,000 people sometimes we went to hickory we had uh 13,000 people i think there three trucks now total uh, this year, uh, I had a sponsored diesel spec there. Out of they're out of uh, Canada. They do tuning and all kinds of stuff. So we went back and forth when I was on a uh, TV show. Uh, one of the guys there now, Mark Springer, he's like a spokesman for them. So he told me to get a hold of them. So I ended up getting a hold of them, and and uh, you know we're kind of, they're kind of like the same realm. So that truck's all black, diesel spec out. You know. It, banners on it and stuff like that and they have a bunch of followers so like videos and chrome and steel radio they help me out a lot with a lot of stuff and you know like i said the part of it for me is like i truck every day like i come to the track i'm i'm either loaded or i've come from somewhere that you know overnight a lot of the, the couple of the guys are do the same thing they work all week they haul coal they they leave on thursday they get to the track friday you know, sometimes I come in like 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning, 11 in the afternoon. Like I said, I'm in it for fun. It's nice to, to do something and compete and, and feel alive again, I guess. So. Well, that's awesome that, uh, that you found that. You had the opportunity to, uh, to become uh, kind of uh, weaned into to racing the trucks to where you, you, you know, got your hands on a couple. That's pretty awesome. Uh, so what was it like? from a trucker's point of view, uh, being involved in a TV show and, and all sorts of things like that? Uh, I guess my personality, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I say what's on my mind, I do what I want. And uh, I guess it kind of like caught their eye. At first it was just, it was supposed to, it was a documentary. The way they, when they did like a casting thing, it was supposed to be for a documentary on trucks and about that and, and like, I'm, I'm strong about trucking and my views on trucking and stuff like that. And, you know, I try to make a difference and try to like show people that it's it's a lot different. Like you know, we all got families, we all got kids. You know, you you know, it's not just like we're picking up hookers and truck stops every night and stuff like that. It's it, a lot of it's different than what people in the general public think. So. down to Austin, Texas, you know, I'd, I'd be trucking somewhere, dump my truck off, fly to green screen, fly back to my truck. Um, as of everybody else, it, that was their main thing. It was, they didn't, 
do anything else. So, you know, what, they would take three days down in Austin. I would fly in the night before, do my thing uh, the next day, and then fly out back to my load or my truck or whatever. Because I, I don't, I didn't have enough people to cover me. Like I barely did what I did anyway. Get through the the filming of it. <clears throat> so they would let you do whatever you wanted normally at first. Like when when you first saw me or when it was first filming. Uh, I was myself. I could do whatever I want, and then they would cut it, and then they would do whatever you wanted after. You know, they, you'd have to kind of do what they wanted or set it up or whatever. So, it's for it's for TV. It's for uh, you know for entertainment. So you have to understand that some, they have to interject. Like you know, they would set me up in a go down a road. It was closed, or you know, they would get me. Or, you know, they have the wrong directions. They'd have something. They'd always throw something in, or but. I always had that like part of it where it was me, and uh, you know then they would start doing they were doing stuff with the bidding and stuff like that. We used to you have to like could they come out you have to bid for a load and I and, and I said to them I said I, I can't it's against my principles I said I'm not I can't do it like that I said you have the opportunity to show people that we can truck and make money and we don't have to cut each other's throats and you don't have to do that and I was like so against doing some things the way they did them. I just wanted it, it needed to be, it was different for me. I didn't, I, you know, fighting for it to go down and down and down wasn't what I wanted. Like we had the opportunity to, to, to show them that everybody can make money. You can, you can bid on and make money and nobody's cutting throats and you do stuff like that. But it's just, it was so hard. Like, you know, like I wish I had more time and to do it uh, a certain way. But like I said, we, Tour, it was it made like a hundred episodes so it was like a, a pretty big deal but to, to to have a chance to be on TV like I said I couldn't I didn't pass it up nobody told me not to do it my wife said go for it you know it's like I said I was nervous because I didn't want to be portrayed as you know I tried to change things and you know you try to make people understand and like first time you know, when it went on TV you know like a couple days later you be walking down the street somebody would recognize you or because it was on pretty heavily on A&E and I could have been on the show like maybe a couple months before that, but they wanted me to drive a pickup truck and do a hot shot stuff. And basically, one of the guys had died, so they kind of wanted me to, to take his spot. And I and I said, I only want to do it in my truck. I don't want to. I'm not a hot shot guy. I'm not. You know, that's not me. So I I passed up on it. And then they wanted to add another truck, so we had another big truck. So you always had to go back. You always had to do retakes. I mean. I remember in my truck, I shot some of it in uh, in spring, you know, and then they had to come back and they had to redo some stuff, and it was winter time. I had like three dudes in my truck, cameras and, and that, and I'm by the Meadowlands. They're trying to find the same, like, look, you know, with the snow on the ground, or, you know, I had to, you had to wear the same clothes. I couldn't change my hair drastically until, like, an episode had aired. Like, there's a lot to it, like, people don't get, you know, you just can't. One day you can't have a, uh, you know, your hair long, and then the next, you know, because it's all, it's co continuity, it's called, you have to look the same, we keep clothes there, and, you know, everybody else kind of had a little different than me, because, you know, they were on it so long, so they had clothes there, and stuff like that, but, like I said, it, it's an experience that I got to do, and, you know, whether it's, uh, it's helped me in my life, yeah, so... One day, I like, I'd like to write a book and go about all the stuff done, so it's all just part of it, I guess. Well, that's awesome. It's, it's great to hear those stories and uh, being being on a, on a television show. You can say you've done it, and like you said, no one said not to do it, so that's great. And so uh, one of the other things that you're, I can probably ask you about there, Chris, is a, a gentleman that a lot of people you know, refer to as Sal, Sal C., at this point, maybe a lot of people know that, that we lost him, you know, a little bit ago. What were some fond memories that you'd want to share that would keep his, uh, the rest of his, not that, uh, to keep his legacy alive, you know, from a, a friend point of view there? Uh, we both kind of were like the same, you know, started young and our fathers were in the trucks and stuff like that. You know, we, we talked a lot. We just... You know, I, I did a lot with him. You know, being uh, growing up and getting into the trucking business there about the same time, being similar ages and things, 
what were some of the other you know fun memories that uh, that you guys would have? I think at some point someone told me about what it was like leaving the buck, you know, getting back on the island and things like that. I'm not sure if you were part of that that group or not, but give me some fond memories there. I mean, just constant ball busting. I mean, we just every day texting weird, you know, we're up all hours of the night, same thing. So it's, you know, we went to truck shows. We just, you know, we're not haters or nothing, but we just, <laughs> you just always ball bust on other people's stuff for fun. And it's just, you know, there's dudes that are like way over the top with like their trucks and, you know, and they're flowers out in front of it or, you know, like glitter on the ground and it's like, our, tr our trucks are always just like down dirty, you know, you just like less is more kind of stuff and, you know, being, him being from the island, me from Jersey, was just always like, you know, Kirky. We, we have a group of us, like his, you know, his cousin, you know, it's just everybody has a personality, everybody has a nickname, it's just like, you know, we're, we have a group chat that we've had for like, you know, for a while, and it's just, you know, his name is still in there and stuff, it sucks, but um, we don't, you know, I know, I think his uh, girlfriend has his phone, uh, she must, like, have no idea what the sh that we had, you know, we just constant, constant, you know, badgering, we pick on his cousin, and, you know, and just, everybody always had fun, you know, that's what's, you know, we're, you're, we're not like a group of older truckers to where it's like, you know, we're complaining about, uh, you know, freight rates and, you know, the coffee and shit like that. We'd make fun of those guys. Like, it was, that was fun to us. So, yeah, he'd call you up in the middle of the night and just be, you know, just spouting off truck movie lines. Like, you know, I'm like a truck nut. Like, convoys, like, I came out to that at my wedding and, you know, I'm I want to build a convoy truck one day. Mac, I have it all in my mind and I have all the parts and, you know, he had just got a cruise liner, he was doing like a uh, big Ben's truck in there. That was like his other thing he was doing. And, you know, we'd talk about that stuff and to, to see all that. And then, you know, like I said, on his funeral and the trucks, like the trucks are like a major part of it. Like, you know, that truck will always remind you of him. Always. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I'm sure a lot of guys that were up there, close friends and guys that were in the area, they have, you know, stories just like that. So I appreciate that. And uh, as we uh, cross into Georgia here, heading up, uh, heading up north, I hope you got a, a good trip up to Atlanta and uh, we'll see you soon. If not, uh, we'll see you on that old oval track there, racing trucks and whatnot. Sure thing, man. 10-4. We'll talk to you soon. Toodles.